Mohammad Mizu has been sworn in as the 8th President of the Republic of Maldives in a ceremony that was held at the Republic Square in its capital, Mali. The oath-taking ceremony was attended by multiple foreign dignitaries that also included India's Union Minister Kirin Rijiju. Other than that, a special envoy of the President of China and State Councillor Shen Waikin was also present at the same ceremony. Now, Maldives have revealed that they are reviewing around 100 agreements that were in the areas of defence and security, which were signed between the previous Ibrahim Mohammed Soli led government and New Delhi as per information that has been provided by a senior Maldivian official. Are these developments then worrying? Let's look into the people currently behind these decisions. Mizu is a former mayor of the capital Mali and a construction minister for the past seven years. He is also a close associate of former Maldives president Abdullah Yamin, who is known for his pro China approach and his sort of dislike for India as he believes that New Delhi has played a role in his defeat in 2018. He has also in the past promised to cultivate stronger ties with China, much like his ally Yamin, who forged strong ties with Beijing. Coming to Abdullah Yamin himself, he has previously been found guilty of corruption and money laundering by a lower court and sentenced to around 11 years in prison. The former president has denied the allegations and it has also been revealed that he relied heavily on China for political and financial support, which was troubling, of course, for India. Abdullah Yamin has often said how he wants to cancel the defence deals that have been signed with India. He has also said that it is imperative that we get the Indian military out before the end of the year because they do not like anyone playing second fiddle in their own country. However, under Soli's leadership, there had been multiple developmental projects that have been signed between Maldives and India. Ahead of the polls, Soli was on a spree inaugurating infrastructure projects, many of which were completed under India's line of credit. The Maldivian Foreign Minister had also announced that India has approved three new projects under the High Impact Community Development Project Grant Scheme. However, the big focus today is the fact or rather the headline that Maldives has asked Indian troops to be removed from its territory. Now, before everybody believes into what Mizu is trying to push the narrative about, India does not in fact station troops in the Maldives. It only has crews and technicians for its patrol vessel, which is the Dornier aircraft, and two ALH helicopters that exist for purposes like medical evacuations, surveillance and air rescue operations. Even the total missions of India have shown an increasing trend from 2019 to 2022, with the numbers of the missions peaking in 2022 at 262 missions, but there is a considerable decrease in 2023, uh, 2023, pardon me, with only 159 missions. So, how exactly do we read then currently what's happening in the Maldives? I have with me Patakrit Payne, I also have with me Gautam Mukherjee, we have Major Rajan Kocher and Professor DK Giri with us on the broadcast. Let me begin this with Major General Rajan Kocher, if I can. Major General Kocher, I did try to explain a little bit about what the Indian troops in Maldives are all about, but I'm going to have to open up that question to you. If you can begin by just telling our viewers, when we say Indian troops stationed in Maldives, what does that truly mean? Devika, uh, just a notional presence of the Indian troops there, basically two helicopters and Donia aircraft there. Some about 60-70 of our military personnel are there. So uh, we really can't say or uh, we cannot presume that India has a military presence in the Maldives. It is uh, uh, a stationing of some 60-70 people does not constitute any great and they are there for a purpose. They are there for a humanitarian kind of a support for the rescue operations which take place there. If you remember in 2004, there was a tsunami in which uh, India did a great deal of rescue work and so many uh, Maldivians were actually saved. So it is not that uh, we have a military presence there. So 
uh, much has been actually uh, made out of it but at the same time i would uh, uh, like to uh, emphasize that maldives has a great strategic significance as far as india is concerned almost 1200 coral islands in this region and gulf of eden and gulf of uh, hormuz and the malacca straits so these are the three prominent areas i would like to highlight here where the maximum sea trade is taking place and today maldives uh, china's interest is extremely great in maldives almost 70% of aid to maldives comes from china so you can understand that uh, over a period of time there has been a radicalization in maldives and uh, uh, thinking on china you know pressure and china has always tried to interfere with the election the process of maldives uh, today it has a uh, you uh, you head of state there who is sympathetic and who has won his election based that he will move these indians out but let me tell you that moving 70 indians out is not going to affect the security scenario as far as india is concerned but uh reviewing almost 100 agreements which have been made by the previous regime is likely to create an impact and it is also at the same time i think china will uh, uh, like to create its own military presence in this area because that is my fear you see our uh, 60 70 uh, people you uh, we never exploited those uh, maldives by our military presence but the uh, moment the way china has done with sri lanka the moment it uh, is positions its uh, uh, naval assets in this area a uh, nuclear uh, submarine or a gunboat or things like that uh, that is going to make a lot of difference because this is supposed to be the toll gate of the indian ocean because uh, uh, china has a weakness in the indian ocean today and th that is why uh, china is trying to create this kind of a situation by bringing in a uh, uh, change of government which is uh, uh, pro uh, china and possibly they don't want any indian presence there because in mm. case this 60 70 uh, soldiers are going to be there uh, they are going to be the eyes and ears of the indian government so anything which happens in uh, maldives also we will come to know so that is the main reason uh, they don't want them there it has got uh, nothing with the security scenario of uh, maldives right absolutely patikrit why do you think one of the first things that uh, miju comes into power and just you know during his oath taking ceremony just right after that one of the first matters he raises is the withdrawal of indian troops and military in manamar which i'd like to just you know clarify as far as the mission types are concerned as per reports mm, they mainly for medical evacuation search and rescue and air patrol well, i think it's a battle of seesaw going on in many of these smaller countries in the south asia region and i don't think uh, it's the end of the story you would see successive successive stories going on uh, for for probably decades like this Uh, unfortunately many of these smaller countries in the south asian region tend to take benefits from both the sides uh, yes there are certain elements who would be pro china uh, but i don't think india is going to disown uh, maldives altogether uh, and i'm sure they will find out way to work with this government as well see let me tell you what uh, you know as general kochar had rightly mentioned that that military presence is a mere symbolic one primarily because maldives doesn't even have the technical wherewithal to maintain or operate those uh, you know two helicopters or the tornier plane in fact that is not even something worth calling about a military presence uh, it's primarily for evacuation purpose and it gives lot of confidence to the uh, you know these uh, tourists which is who come to maldives because of the presence of these indian personnel over there and it's very it would be very interesting to see what this present government would do uh because invariably when it comes to issues of natural calamities because of ge geographical proximity it would be india who would be the first respondent it cannot be china and at the same time uh, you know there are 100 plus projects which have been funded by india there's a 100 million dollar grant which has been given 400 million dollar of letter of credit which has been given primarily for the greater malay connectivity project so i think these uh, you know this chap would try to take the financial benefit out of india at the same time would not want to have any kind of other presence not that india interfaced 
but uh, i think the chinese definitely are you know pressurizing them and mm-hmm. even though he keeps on claiming that no no i don't want to get into this issue we don't want military presence from both the either of the sides the reality is that china would try to put them in that uh, same dead trap like the belt and road initiative through which they have done for sri lanka and did not do anything when sri lanka was in trouble uh, i think one issue that we must remember is that for many of the smaller economies they feel they genuinely feel that india is not vindictive so even if they do certain things india would not strike back but they fear the chinese retribution and that's the reason they do certain things like this but eventually you know what happens they will feel the heat today or tomorrow again and the fear is genuine like in the hamban tota port where no commercial uh, ship comes but the chinese spy ships do come for surveillance purpose there is a possibility in the entire maldivian uh, region there's a huge archipelago the chinese would definitely try to uh, have their presence military naval presence so it's a battle which will continue like this diplomatic military battle of nerves over the last next few decades as well but maldives is actually putting itself in a very difficult situation by doing something like this and i would not be surprised if through the back door channel the same chap is asking the indians to continue to do what it, india is doing in terms of other economic projects uh, it's a reality of today where some of these countries tend to take benefit from both sides but unfortunately sri lanka is a great example of what it happens mm. invariably if you do that but unfortunately lessons have not been learned so maldives uh, i wish them good and i'm sure indian government will find out ways uh, to presume that 75 p personnel over there is a great presence i mean for a country with such uh, naval capability and two air- aircraft carriers with lakshadweep very much in the proximity i don't think india would have a much, much to lose i think the maldivians themselves a 7 billion dollar economy taking such a steer, risk i think it's not worth for them they could have done something better than this okay gautam mukherjee you. bringing into the conversation when we talk about lessons to be learned now i'd just like to go back to sri lanka for a moment when we saw the tide shifting in sri lanka ultimately it always boils down to the leader to the person in charge so that shift in sri lankan policy happened under the rajapakshas who were pro china they were chinese allies and therefore they allowed the country they you know ultimately the human beings that allowed the country to fall into china's debt trap diplomacy what i want to understand from you is what do you think india can do or what is it that we need to focus on that we our relations with a nation are not simply based on the leadership that takes over because we can't be keep we can't rely on who's going to come to power next the relationship should be such that no matter who comes to power they have to continue their ties with your country well uh, in terms of our traditional uh, sort of sphere of influence we've counted maldives for a very long time at the same time uh, being an islamic country it is prone to coups we've seen that happen before and when there's a coup then the former head of state runs off to sri lanka and then goes back and this kind of thing this particular situation is typical of the chinese they're putting pressure in bhutan they put pressure in maldives uh, but we are reasonably well placed we have a base of sorts in uh, the seychelles we have a good relationship with mauritius Diego Garcia is not far. Um, Maldives cannot really fit the bill in terms of, uh, you know, being a toll keeper, as you put it, in uh, the Indian Ocean. But it is of concern to India because it's only 600 kilometers or so away. Um, having said that, uh, like. Parikshit, I am of the opinion not to take these people too seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they can do without us, uh, and uh, we have to uh, not be very reactive. But certainly, we should build our resources in uh, other locations close enough so that 
the leverage factor that exists in the Maldives goes away. They don't want our protection. They don't want our help. I, I think it will be basically, if that is the case, if that is what this new president is trying to aim at, it will probably be to their detriment rather than ours. Okay. Professor D.K. Giri, bringing you into the conversation, I just want to understand from you then, what do you feel then that a China offers or what carrots does a China dangle? Because I'm sure that these leaders are also people who know what has happened in Nepal. They know what's happened in Bhutan. They know what the Chinese were trying in Bangladesh. They've seen what has happened in Sri Lanka. So what is it that China is possibly offering that country after country, their leadership or they manage somehow the Chinese to convince some part of a leadership in these nations that, listen, you back us, you ally with us, and it's all uphill from here. Yeah. Um, I would uh, answer uh, this by um, quoting uh, a statement made by the Nepalese ambassador, Mr. Upadhyay. I was in a seminar, and he said, we have a roti beti relations with India, but China has a bit. China has surplus money. That is why you go to them. So it is not for the country. Politics is very complex. The leaders may be benefiting from that uh, largesse that they get from China. Not only for the country. You see, Pakistan military leadership has always done that because uh, the money they got from uh, United States, they use it for themselves. Mm -hmm. So the corrupt leadership does not think of the national interest. And they think of themselves. This leader, whether he is untwisted. This particular leader in uh, uh, Maldives, whether he's arm twisted or he has been bribed and he's uh, uh, getting um, for his elections, he got money from China. We don't know. So uh, China, uh, the leadership and uh, Chinese uh, nexus is there. So uh, all leaders, you don't assume that they think of the national interest. But I want to make another point. You know, like my panelists, they said it. Uh, all of them, I agree with them. But what is uh, India? India's role in countering China. China is encircling India through the uh, through our neighbors, instigating them. Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, now Maldives. You see, so how should we uh, win them back? And what would be our strategy to uh, counter China in this? If they will continue to do that. They will bribe them, and their um, you know uh, their. Uh, uh, GDP is five times or six times higher than us. So with this economic asymmetry, how do you counter China? And I have said in your channel many times that we have been fumbling. I give 10 out of 10 to Modi's government on foreign policy, but not on China. China, we have been fumbling. What resources we should use? Diplomatic, right alliances. You know, we are talking of a third policy, multi-alignment or uh, non-alignment again. You know, will that work? We should offer an alternative to our neighbors where they should be more secure and they should be comfortable with us so that they don't fall prey to Chinese trap, as you said, the Chinese debt trap. You know, so the clear alternative has to be given. You know, say that you are taking this money, but you will go bankrupt. You know, Pakistan went bankrupt and, you know, this fellow had to run away from his country, as Pakistan, you mentioned. All that is happening, but they will still continue to do it unless there is an alternative. And that alternative is not being offered by India. They do not know where we stand vis-a-vis -vis China. You know, that is, in fact, China is a menace to the whole world, really. China is a threat to the world security and world uh, liberal system. And uh, is India doing enough to expose that? Because we lose, uh, we are the worst victim of Chinese uh, aggression, Chinese expansion, and Chinese maneuvering around us. But uh, we are not rising up to it. That's my disappointment. I've written extensively on this, that what is our China policy? China is doing, they, they believe in, you know, so-called art of war, the Sun Tzu's policy, you know, stress the enemy, lull them into uh, complacence, and then attack. You know, Chou Enlai did that with Nehru, and Xi Jinping did with our uh, strong Prime Minister Modi. So my, you know, I reiterate my uh, uh, despair that we do not have a China policy. Okay. You know, our trade is booming with China. You know, I, I don't know how, how are we countering it. And China is, is occupying 4,800 uh, 4, kilometers of our land and nipping away time and again, claiming our natural presence. Where do we stand in China? We don't speak out. We don't name China internationally. Who are our allies? Have we made our allies to counter China? If tomorrow you war, there is a war between India and China, who will come to our rescue? Okay.
Okay, so all right. That. Okay. Appropriate alliance making to counter China. Okay, and we should I, say I, that I believe no some, 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 Thank you. something has been yeah. done on that front as far as the Quad is concerned, but I understand your point. Fair enough. I'm yeah. going to uh, open up this question, last question to both Patakrit and Major and Rajan Kochan. Same thing, Patakrit, I just want to understand from you then. Like I said, uh, it can't always be a leader-to-leader -leader relationship. We can't expect that the leadership in our country to always be liked by the leadership of the other country. And it does ultimately, like I said, boil down to somewhere corrupt leaders. We've seen it in Sri Lanka. We've seen it in Nepal. We're now probably seeing it in Maldives as well. Abdullah Yamin, uh, the Mizu's uh, uh, predecessor, was uh, in fact accused of taking bribes from China. What is it that you feel that India can do, that relations with India can move beyond just the leadership coming in and out. We've made investments worth $1.5 billion. That's a significant amount of money. But what, what else would you suggest can be possibly done? Well, I think beyond diplomacy, you know, we have to cultivate relationships, people-to-people uh, -people relation, even at a higher level. And more intensively, we have to invest whether we like it or not, uh, the Chinese have been doing it with the Confucius Institute for a long time. Uh, we, we, most people hate China, but they have become indispensable in certain ways. Th that's a reality. So one thing I want to say is that, number one, we have to have a hands-off policy at times. You know, I respect what the government of India does in terms of going out and helping even those countries who are against us. But they take us for granted at times. You know, uh, the Sri Lankans will take help from us knowing that the Chinese will not help them. And at the same time, they'll allow the Chinese ships to come and uh, anchor in the Hambantota. So I think sometimes you need to, sometimes you need to have a carrot and stick policy and not all the time the carrot. I 100% support the or decisions on the policies of the government of India, but sometimes you just let them suffer for some time and don't allow them to presume that whatever happens, India will always be the good guy and helping us. But when our better times come, we will take, we will hold the hand of China again. That is one thing we need to be uh, careful about. But at the same time, yes, on issues of you know countering China, I'm sure a lot of things are being done, and we can have a separate debate on that. In terms of production link incentive, it will take time. You know, see from a time when we had less than two mobile manufacturing company to becoming the second largest mobile manufacturing uh, you know country in the world. It take it took time, but we did it. So let please give half a decade to the production link incentive in 14 to 15 sectors. It is working, but it will take time. You know, that is one thing we have to uh, have some patience. Yes, uh, in terms of military preparedness, let me tell you whatever alliances you talk about, when it when the full push comes to a shop, you have to fight your own war. And if you look, look at the naval of, let's not compare what happened during Nehru's time and right now, because Nehru's time, there was a 1962 full-fledged war. In Galwan, a war did not happen. They know where to put stop because today's India is not of 1962. Yes, there is a disparity of GDP and that's a lot of work has been done in terms of enhancing the you know, economic resilience of India before you actually you know, uh, show off your military prowess. So we have to give time for the simple reason that 10 to 15 years we had a situation in India where there were policy paralysis for almost 10 years. So let's give a little credit to the government. Okay. Good decisions, good suggestions are always welcome. I respect DK Giriji for whatever he's saying, but I think we need a little more patience given the complexity of the world today. It is not a zero-sum game or a black and white game. It's difficult. It's not so easy. Okay, I'm going to leave the last word with Major, Major General Rajan Kocha. We're running out of time, but it's the same question to you. What do you think? Because as Patakrit was pointing out that uh, you, you can love China, you can hate China, but somehow it becomes difficult to ignore China. It does uh, have its way of becoming an indes indispensable part of countries' economies. And therefore, we've also seen countries like the U.S. struggling to come up with some sort of a way to make China pinch without you know, hurting themselves. See, Rebecca, there are certain uh, issues with our first neighborhood policy. You can see what is happening in uh, uh, Nepal. And we uh, started off with Agni Veers and there was a huge uh, UN cry in Nepal and we have certain uh, problems in that first neighborhood policy which I think needs a review and as far as uh, Maldives is concerned you can see that China has already made inroads. The international airport in uh, Maldives has been expanded with the help of China. Uh, 10,000 houses in Maldives have been built by China. So China has uh, done more for the Maldives 
uh, then what actually India has done, because that is the perception of the people of Maldives. Mm. And that is why with this sort of a election manifesto, this guy actually came and he said, uh, we will uh, move out of the Indians and he uh, uh, won the elections. So uh, we have to understand that uh, India needs to be slightly more uh, proactive in its foreign policies with its neighbors. Unfortunately, we are mostly reactive. And as far as building of alliances is concerned, I want the audience to be rest assured that if there is a war with the China, Indian Army has got sufficient strength today to give it back to China and we don't need anybody's help. Of course, uh, United States, Russia, Iran, uh, allies as far as the military equipment is concerned and that kind of support will come to India. Boots on ground may not come but material support will come to India from all these countries including Israel. So because we have a strategic partnership as far as our military trade is concerned. So yes. let us not feel that we are isolated and more. If war will take place, these countries are going to support us. So uh, uh, let's not give an impression to the viewers that uh, we are going to be isolated in war and we have to fight our own war. It will not be like that. We have sufficient uh, friends who are enemies of China and uh, they will come to our aid and we will uh, give them a befitting reply. Right, absolutely. I thank all of our panelists for joining us uh, to take this conversation forward. That's all that uh, the time that we have. Uh, stay tuned to NewsX. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.